Thanks so much. It's great to be here. I um, was uh, most reminded. I, I, I've uh, when I when I walked. I, I, have you ever read H.P. Lovecraft, the uh, writer, the eighteen? Uh, we wrote in the 19 teens and 20s about this sort of evil university in which the professors, the evil professors, were worshiping ev these dark gods that had the head of a crab with talons and things like that. And then I saw Evil Buddy, Bucky, Bucky Evil Bucky, and I thought, goodness gracious, this this looks just like the sort of evil gods that the faculty worship. So you should look up H.P. Lovecraft. He's, he's a kind of source for most modern science fiction. Uh, and uh, anyways, it's, it's, uh, it's lovely to be here. It's a fantastic university. I love this place. I want to talk to you today about the how a mortgage crisis becomes a market meltdown. And of course, to start this, I'll have to start with this uh, picture. This is my grandmother uh, in her sweet 16. Uh, 1929, and my grandmother, uh, who kind of raised me, uh, she's she died recently, um, said to me that the 1930s, the depression of the 1930s, was a terrible time. She she turned she turned 16 in, in 1929. She saw the worst of the 1930s, but she said it wasn't nearly as bad as the depression of 1873. Uh, she was raised by her grandparents, uh, who uh, lived through the Depression of 1873 and saw that crisis happen. So this is, this is them. Uh, Muffer and Mummer are the, the names. Uh, it's a Swedish for mother's mother and mother's father uh, and, and their, their daughters. Uh, my, so that my great-grandmother is up, uh, let's see, up there on the upper left. No, so, sorry, she's sitting right here. And, uh, these are my great great grandparents. And they lived through the Depression of 1873. And so this is, this is one of those things I learned very early on about what, what this depression was and how it happened. Uh, and so I, as I watched in 2006 and 2007 and 2008 the, the uh, developing financial crisis, I was struck not by the parallels to the 1929 depression, which a lot of people had written about. In fact, the depression of the 30s had very little to do with what happened in 2008 and 2009. Uh, there, was, there were problems with bank liquidity, there were problems with uh, credit, but they weren't, they were very, very different problems then. But 1873 was very different. Now, I'm not going to tell you any f personal stories because I don't have a lot of great personal Swedish stories from my grandmother, unless you want to learn how to make lingonberries or uh, the, um, the, the great value of antacids. Uh, but I will talk to you a little bit about how the 1873 crisis uh, developed. It started with a building boom in the latter part of the 1860s in the three capital cities of Europe, uh, the three empires of Europe. The uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, which uh, was in Vienna and stretched all the way uh, to the borders of uh, Turkey, to, to the Black Sea, to the Adriatic uh, Sea. Many, uh, lots and lots of countries, including Romania, parts of Poland and others, were part of this massive Austro-Hungarian Empire. And in the 1860s, uh, Louis, the, um, the emperor took down the wall around the city and built this, called the Ringstrasse, the, the, the um, ring of the street ring. And basically, he, t he tore down the, 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 um, the walls and built this big, wide boulevard. And a building boom started in the capital of Austria-Hungary, in Vienna. Um, prices doubled and then doubled again in the space of three and four years uh, for houses and mortgages. There are new mortgage banks that emerged in the Austro-Hungarian Empire centered in Austria that began lending at a fierce rate. And lots of people would buy a house, buy, one of these, uh, buy and build one of these three or four story houses. And once they completed it, before they'd even started renting it, um, they would um, uh, collect another mortgage and start building again. This is this massive increase in the values of homes around uh, Vienna in the capital city. It's a similar boom that happens in Berlin. Uh, in the uh, uh, in, the, in the latter part of the 1860s, it's in, in German, it's called the Gründerzeit, the Founders Period, and uh, there's a, there's massive uh, building. And likewise in Paris, 
uh, Louis Napoleon tears down uh, many of the city walls. He tears down many of the simple, uh, the, the narrow streets and builds up a, um, um, a, a massive kind of capital. So the most beautiful, if you've ever visited Vienna, Paris, and Berlin, or if you go to visit those places, uh, all the marvels that you see in those places, almost all of them, were built between the latter part of the 1860s and 1873. Um, all of this was fueled by a new series of banks that emerged in the 1860s. Banks before the 1860s in much of Europe were uh, banks that effectively lent for trade, long distance trade, they lent to merchants, they didn't lend to regular uh, borrowers. But these new kinds of banks that emerge, the Crédit Mobilier, Crédit Foncier, uh, modeled on the pattern that's established by Louis Napoleon in the French Empire in Paris in the 1860s, um, is, starts to make uh, lots and lots of uh, loans for land and for mortgages. This is a Russian bank uh, in Odessa which was uh, now part of the Ukraine, but was then part of um, the, Roman, uh, the Russian Empire, uh, in which also uh, mortgage lending was taking place. This whole system of building in these three capital cities, Vienna, Paris, and Berlin, were premised on a free trade regime that had emerged uh, from the 1850s, 1860s. So there had previously been tariffs, block, uh, the attempts to block international trade uh, that, had, uh, that had gone on for centuries. But in the 1840s and 1850s, uh, modeling themselves on Britain, Paris, uh, the French Empire, the, the uh, Prussian Empire, and the Prussian Empire is based in, centered in Berlin, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire all lower their tariff barriers and free trade uh, commences in that period. The idea is that free trade is going to lift everyone up all at the same time. This seems to work uh, for about uh, 15 to 20 years, and then a new competitor in the late part of the 1860s comes along. The new competitor is us, the United States. Uh, what had happened is that Britain is exporting all sorts of manufactured goods to the rest of Europe. Europe is providing food to Britain. So Britain is growing much less of its food than previously. Uh, lots and lots of wheat, lots and lots of flour, uh, corn, oil, rapeseed oil. All these other things are flowing into Britain in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, and Britain is exporting lots of manufactured goods. But this new competitor, us, comes along in 18, so why 18, why would, uh, why would the US suddenly be a new competitor uh, in the latter part of the 1860s? Civil War. Civil War. Civil War. The Civil War's over, right? And so previously there'd been all this conflict, but by 1865, that conflict is over, and during the war, there are four railroad corridors that are built from Chicago to New York. Continuous lines of railroad that uh, connect those places together. There had been railroads before. They, they had been law, small and local. They'd stopped at various towns. Those railroads are consolidated and, uh, and, and uh, deepened. The route is shortened and made more efficient. Why would, why would you, in the uh, um, 1861 and 1862, why would it be so important to bridge all the railroads in that period? Yeah. Get munitions and supplies to your troops. Munitions and supplies to troops. So, so basically, the, it's military necessity that forces all these towns, which had previously been breaks in railroads, to build to allow continuous railroads to pass through their towns, to allow New York to connect to um, Chicago. In particular, those that's the big competitive uh, region. The other region is the Mississippi River is closed, right? Because the Confederacy controls New Orleans. New Orleans is the, is the exit point for the Mississippi River. And so there's no way of using the rivers anymore. And so the railroads become much more significant, much more important. So these railroad corridors that go from Chicago to New York are completed during the war. And then after the war, what they start to ship is wheat. 80% of the volume of goods that are traveling from Chicago to New York in 1870s and 1880s is wheat in the grain that's being shipped not to New York, but to Europe not to Europe, but to Britain in particular, to Liverpool. And so suddenly, between 1868 and 1872, the price of wheat starts to plummet, drop precipitously. And no longer can the US, uh, no longer can those other parts of Europe 
ship wheat to on international markets. Um, once that corridor is established, the U.S. starts to send other things. An abattoir is formed in Philadelphia for uh, sending out dressed meat. So basically cattle that are picked up uh, far away as um, Texas, uh, shipped by car from Chicago to New York, and then cut up in uh, places like Philadelphia or New York, and then shipped abroad. The other thing that emerges in this period is oil. Uh, oil is discovered in 1861. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and oil is not gasoline. No one was using gasoline uh, in particular in this period. What, what they were using was kerosene. Kerosene was a cheap replacement for whale oil, and it was also a cheap replacement for rapeseed oil, which was, again, a big European export to Britain. So what happens basically is that international markets are roiled. International markets are screwed up, <laughs> messed up by this drastic change in international commodity prices uh, in the latter part of the 1860s. So what happens then is that this plan, this plan of Europe sending food to Britain, Britain sending manufactured goods back. All of this free trade kind of international trade works as long as there's no brand new international competitor. It's a global, in the words of uh, modern finance folks, the US is a global deflator, a global deflator. That means that in international terms, it's pushing down prices. What's a global deflator in the modern context, the 2000s? China. China. Right. So in the 1870s, the U.S. is the global uh, deflator, but in the 2000s, China is the global deflator. So there's this new economic power that's come in and that's changing international uh, trade drastically. The most visible effect of this is in, well, there are two, two places in which the banks then start to crumble. One is banks that loan for international trade. And uh, the first banks that fail are actually in Russia because Odessa is one of the big places where wheat comes out. So Odessa is coming down the Black Sea, out around Italy, up uh, around Spain and France and to Britain. That trade is effectively uh, gone, or not gone, but drastically reduced by 1872 and 1873. So the banks in Odessa fail in 1872, but it's the major city banks in the major European capitals. You know, that, those, that failure in 72 was nothing, really. It's, it's a relatively small amount of capital. But by 1873, the big capital cities, the centers of the sort of European nation states uh, are in trouble. And it, the crash first happens in May of 1873 in Vienna. And in this period, stock and bond prices drop precipitously. It's first the banks that fail, and then as the banks fail, people start to unload all of their stocks and bonds. They sell them at fire sale prices of basically 15, 15 cents, 10 cents on the dollar. This leads to calamity in Europe in May and June of 1873. And this is one of the kind of dirty little secrets of the 19th century U.S. is that um, we think about the U.S. economy as being independent, but it's very closely tied to the European economy. So uh, what happens is the Bank of England uh, discount rate sh starts to um, spike very rapidly right around 1873. That means that to borrow money short term, the price goes up very quickly. So it had hovered between two and four and a half percent for 40 years. Had never gone above four and a half percent in that entire period. Suddenly it spikes up to six, seven, eight, and nine percent. That means that people who are borrowing money short term are in serious trouble. Not just people in Europe, but anyone that's borrowing on the British, in the, in the British e economic system. And that means everybody in the world. Right. Everybody in the world is effectively borrowing uh, at these rates. And I'm going to jump ahead to another chart for a second. So this is the short-term rate in Britain from 1866 uh, to 1873. And, and I'm sorry, there is one other spike, a brief spike in, uh, in 70. But other than that, a very kind of stable, uh, sorry, the, 
sorry, the 10%, this is a, there's a British bank failure in 1866 of over, over and gurney. And that's the one uh, sort of distortion in that period. But other than that, we see uh, quite stable, if we went back all the way to um, 1815 or 1816, we'd see real stability here, and then this sort of spikiness. What it means is the Bank of England is concerned about the security of these other banks. The Bank of England thinks that some of these banks are in trouble knows that the Bank of Vienna is in trouble, suspects that the that Berlin banks are in trouble, suspects also that the Parisian banks are in trouble. And so what they do is they raise the lending rate. That is, the cost to borrow money goes up quickly. The reason they want to do this is they want to hold back gold. They don't want to have outstanding loans to these banks that aren't going to get paid off. And so the cost to borrow money goes up. The Bank of England sets a higher rate. International bankers, bankers in the US now, borrow from Britain. So if any, any uh, company that's sold in the 19th century in the US, basically stocks by and large are held in the US, bonds by and large are held in Europe. So all the long-term money lending is coming from Europe. And the, uh, when the British Bank of England catches a cold, uh, the US uh, gets pneumonia. So effectively what happens. So if you're JP Morgan, Right? If you're one of the largest capitalists in the United States, if you're, uh, well, who else is an important? There aren't a lot of uh, familiar names. If you're um, Lehman, uh, Carnegie at that point is, is a nobody. In 1873, he's really a nobody. Uh, by the latter, latter part of the 1870s, he, he, he's one, somebody who does spectacularly well because of the panic. But um, it's uh, Morgan or Lehman, um, you are borrowing at this rate, right, this low British rate because you can borrow in Britain, and you're lending at this blue rate. So you make your money on the gap between those two things, right? So if, the, um, if it's 2% to borrow in Britain, and it's 8% to lend in the US, that's the US lending rate, you make quite a bit of money in that period. And that's how kind of international uh, financial capitalists work. But what happens here is crazy time. No one predicts, no one imagines that for an extended period of time, the rate's going to go to six and a half or seven percent. But it does. Okay. So here's the irony. The U.S. gets involved in this international trade for the first time. Um, the U.S. has been, you know, sending out other goods, cotton and things like that. But uh, the wheat trade is brand new. The U.S. is involved, it's, it's making a great people, individual people who are selling wheat, uh, merchants, uh, railroads are doing quite well, but they're still sitting between those two rates. They're borrowing at the British rate and they're lending at the U.S. rate. When the British rate shoots up, they're in trouble. This is the Hatch family uh, in 1870. Uh, might also talk about the Frick family or the, uh, the um, or the Cook family, the Jay Cook family. These are the kind of masters of the universe in the 1870s, the big bankers in this period. And many of them make their money by gathering up bonds from American railroads, collecting them, and then reselling them in Britain, okay? So in 1870 and 1871, they're gathering up these bonds and they're holding them for a short period of time to sell them in Britain. Unfortunately, they're holding them a little longer than they expected. Because in 1872 and 1873, they're, uh, you heard the expression borrow short, lend long? Borrow short, lend long? That's what banks do. Okay? When, that's what most financial intermediaries do. They um, borrow money over the short term and they lend it over the long term. A bank will give you a mortgage right, which is a 30-year 30 30 mortgage or a 20-year mortgage. Uh, it will lend you things for a long stretch of time, and it borrows money for a short stretch of time. When, it, when you make a deposit, you're going to pick up the money again three weeks or two weeks or maybe two months later. So it's your, they're, they're effectively borrowing your money. They're holding your money for the short term, and they're lending it for the long term. The Hatch family is in that situation. What happens, though, is that the short suddenly goes very high, very quickly. And so to keep recirculating this money, they're holding these bonds, they have to borrow on the short-term interest rates, um, and the short-term interest rates shoot up higher than they'd ever imagined. Not because of anything they've done, but because of failures in Vienna, Berlin, and Paris. But it doesn't matter, 
If the cost to borrow triples in the space of uh, uh, six months and you're holding 30 or 40 million dollars worth of railroad bonds, you are dead, right? You are gone. And that's what happens to lots and lots of American Brit uh, banking firms in 1873. So in May uh, is when the bank failure hits Vienna, Paris, and Berlin, uh, b based in large part on the failure of these mortgages. But by October and November, the crash happens in the United States. These are the bonds that are issued, and ordinarily, we think of bonds as safe investments, right? A stock is a relatively unsafe investment, a bond is a relatively safe investment. Uh, you'll buy a bond and you'll get paid by, uh, in, 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 in the case of a railroad, you'll, um, you'll spend money on a bond and you'll get, in five years, you'll get 10%, uh, and another, in another year you'll get 10% more, and it, it pays you over a, uh, an extended period of time. Initially, railroad bonds were pretty good deals, but by 1870, 71, 72, there are a lot of transcontinental railroads that are being promoted. The Northern Pacific, uh, the Western Pacific, the Kansas Pacific, the Southern Pacific, a lot of railroads that are proposing to go all the way to uh, California. And these railroads are issuing bonds uh, that are really speculative bonds. Bonds that are really, that the likelihood that these things are gonna get paid off is very slim. Um, so the place that they advertise is, as you can see below, Christian, the Christian Union. They advertise in, in, in uh, Christian magazines, uh, hoping to, to reach out to widows and orphans and other people who have some capital. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, disturbing uh, phenomenon, but there are lots and lots of these bonds. And if you look at the advertisements here, convertible Midland bonds, a 7% mortgage bond for sale on one of the great roads running from New York City on the third largest road in New York State. Um, and uh, it turns out that being the third largest railroad in New York State is not actually that useful. Uh, there's a huge price war going on as, as these four railroads are competing from Chicago to New York. Um, a lot of these 7% the 7% gold bonds, the impression that you get is these things are backed by gold. They're not. They're, they're just a little gold trim around the edge of the bonds. Uh, that's why they're called gold bonds. Uh, and so this, uh, you've heard the expression the Gilded Age, the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age is, refers to this period of um, when, when um, these, this sort of Gilded Age uh, securities are issued. And, and, and they look like gold on the outside. Gilded means they're gold on the outside and base metal like uh, iron or something like that underneath. Jay Cook fails in November of 1873. And uh, Jay Cook is an important person to fail because he's the person who really created uh, an international, a uh, first a, national, a real national market for U.S. bonds. No one imagined that Jay Cook could fail, but Jay Cook is in the situation where he's borrowing short and lending long. He's holding lots and lots of bonds that he's going to issue, tens of millions of dollars worth of bonds that he's going to issue, and he's got to borrow on the short-term rates. When the short-term rates spike up. He can't make his payments, and he can't unload the bonds, and so he fails. Jay Cook's failure uh, begins the panic of 1873 in uh, the United States. And so you can see here, there's this spike in, um, you know, in, in May of, January and May of 1873, and then a huge spike, 17.5% rate to borrow money, and that's from an absolutely fantastic borrower, somebody who you trust implicitly. You will lend them, um, you will lend them $100, but you want 17% back. Um, uh, and, this is, and this is over a short term, this is just for three months. So this is the panic of 1873 in the United States. So we think about panics as being terrible times, and they are terrible times in the US. Uh, this is Jay Cook, and this is his bank. This is Black Friday. Uh, sorry, I said November. It's September 19th of 1873 is when um, Cook fails. And it's in this period that we see the term tramp and bum first emerge, as thousands of people lose their jobs in uh, after September of 1873. Both those terms, tramp and bum, refer to Union Army soldiers, ex-Union Army soldiers. Um, tramp is from a, from a Union Army song, tramp, 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 the soldiers are coming. Uh, bummer 
is a term for the people who were in Sherman's army, right? Sherman's march that marched the sea. And bummers were considered the poor white Union soldiers who ransacked southern plantations. So the term bummer uh, is applied to them. And so the words tramp and bum first emerge. And many of these are Union Army and Confederate Army veterans who are traveling around without work, men in their 20s and 30s. And so the tramp and the bum become kind of uh, familiar figures. And it's a tremendous increase in unemployment. Uh, 25 to 30% unemployment in New York City. Uh, and it's in uh, Tompkins Square, where um, in January of 1874, and so this is the first real winter, right, after the panic. The September of 1873 is when the panic happens. This is the first winter. And in what was called outdoor relief, cities were supposed to provide support for people in these um, periods. But um, what happens is uh, the um, lots and lots of people um, organize in the um, in the city of New York, arguing that that they need you know more that they're that they're uh, the bread lines there's not enough food in the bread lines that there's not enough soup, and um, in the Thompson Square riot in January of 1874, basically uh, the city police uh, uh, break in. They, they um, uh, dozens of people um, over a dozen people are killed in the Tompkins Square riot. Uh, hundreds of other are wounded. Uh, this is the sort of 1874 version of Occupy. By 1877, three years later, we see what's called the Great Upheaval, the biggest strike, uh, biggest general strike in the history of the world. Uh, you see uh, that it begins on the railroads, in um, those very same railroads that were shipping wheat from Chicago to New York. It starts in Martinsburg, West Virginia, then it spreads to Philadelphia, Boston, uh, New York, and Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, um, there are strikers, but it's actually the sort of general population that starts to uh, rise up in the city of Pittsburgh. And so it's not just people who are uh, on the railroads, but people who are uh, sort of generally unemployed. It's a huge uh, number of people, and they start burning. Uh, they burn the Lebanon Valley Railroad Bridge, and we see uh, mayhem. In Philadelphia, uh, Union troops are ordered to disperse the crowds. Uh, and they fire into the crowds in 1877, uh, killing uh, close to 10 people. The mobs in Pittsburgh take over uh, you know, much of downtown Pittsburgh, much of the city uh, itself is uh, destroyed. So what are the long-term effects of this panic? Well, in Europe, uh, things are bad. Well, uh, there are a lot of kind of terrible things that happen in Europe. And in, in fact, in Europe, it's a much more protracted uh, depression. So it's called the Long Depression from 1873 to about 1890. Uh, it's a very long uh, period in which there are relatively few um, increases in uh, uh, d domestic product in any of the major um, European states. What also emerges is, as this image, I think, shows, if you look carefully at it, um, a rise in anti-Semitism. You'll see here that this is a bank, and lots and lots of people are lined up. The bank is about to, s to fail. But there's one man who's walking away with money in his pockets. And in the, in the images of the 19th century, this is supposed to be, you, you, this is the Jew, right? The black long coat, the long nose, um, the, the small mustache the waxed hair. All of this suggests in the context of the, of the European um, kind of tr tradition that Jews somehow benefit from this crisis. And so in 1875 and 1876, we start to see, uh, and then particularly in the latter part of the 1870s, we see um, a huge rise in what's called modern anti-Semitism. So anti-Jewish uh, sentiment. It's no longer, there, you know, th there had been opposite, there had been, um, so superstitions about Jews that had gone on for a long time in Europe. You know, stories about you know, Jews um, using the blood of children to make matzah, all these other kinds of anti-Semitic things, that Jews are greedy, that Jews are evil, that they hoard gold. All those sorts of things are very old and ancient. But by the latter part of the 1870s, there's this new kind of anti-Semitism uh, that emerges in Vienna in particular, and the, cap the mayor of Vienna, it, who says, you know, our financial crisis was brought about, if you look at the names of the people who are at the heads of these railroads and the heads of these companies, what are their names? Hauptmann, um, Hausmann, uh, 
they, they are Jews. And so the, this is what's significant about this, what's important about this is that Jews had very few rights in much of Europe and Russia in the 1840s and 1850s, but by around the 1850s, associated with the sort of liberalization of trade, Jews are allowed to um, sort of participate in markets. They're not allowed, in most cases, to own land. Okay, so Jews are not allowed to own land. So the things that Jews can own if they collect money is not land, it has to be movable assets, stocks, bonds, or gold. And so the people who you see in these markets are Jewish people, not because Jews are all uh, you know, collectors of gold, but because Jews are effectively barred from owning anything else besides uh, movable goods. In the area around Odessa, and this is a Russian picture, um, Jews were allowed to own land, but not anywhere near the railroads, not anywhere near where um, the wheat was exported because they might um, benefit. And so what we see then is a, a rise of modern anti-Semitism, um, which is going to come to uh, its, its head in the 1880s and 1890s and is going to form the basis for uh, the modern Nazi movement uh, by the 1920s and 30s. They're going to look back to the 1890s as sort of, a sort of birth of this new kind of unified Germany. Uh, but this is not just Germany. This is also Austria-Hungary. Uh, not just Prussia, but this is also Austria-Hungary. This is also um, Russia. And there's a, uh, this is the period in the pogroms of the 1880s and the 1890s that follow. Um, in fact, many, many of you who have kind of um, ancestors who are Jewish uh, would have come over in the 1890s, likely because of these pogroms, because of these um, Russian troops uh, moving in, uh, attacking Russian villages, believing that uh, Jews were somehow behind uh, all of uh, Russia's financial problems and that Jews were plotting to assassinate the emperor. Uh, this is information that was circulated by uh, the Russian government itself. So that's Europe. <laughs> so it's not a pretty picture, the, what follows from this. Uh, but the other thing that follows in Europe is the rise of tariff barriers. So the rise, uh, so Britain um, doesn't change its, its laws, but Austria-Hungary starts to impose tariff barriers. France starts to impose tariff barriers. Uh, Germany does. That is, to, you can't ship goods into those countries without paying a heavy tax to get those goods in. So we think about free trade now. We have what's effectively, by comparison to the rest of the world, kind of through time, a relatively high period of free trade. It starts uh, in, Roughly, uh, you know, depending on the percentage you want to talk about, roughly the 1970s and 1980s until today. <laughs> Before that, there was only one period of free trade, and that was from 1850 to 1873. And 1873 was the end of it. After this, France, Germany, Austria, Hungary, all of those places start to erect tariff barriers to block international trade because they believe that international trade is a source of their problems. But in this period, we see tremendous in the US anyways, tremendous advances. Why? Because goods are cheap, right? Andrew Carnegie, he makes his fortune in the Panic of 1873, right in the teeth of the Panic of 1873. And Andrew Carnegie, uh, there's some funny things about Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was a telegraph boy for the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, Tom Scott. He was a, really a nobody uh, until Pennsylvania Railroad um, decides that it needs to buy steel it, uh, for, for the rails because steel lasts longer than iron. It needs a steel works. Um, and Tom Scott decides he's going to make a little extra money on the side by telling his telegraph, sending his telegrapher out to set up a steel mill which will be secretly operated by the Pennsylvania Railroad so the Pennsylvania Railroad can make its own money, right? So that the Pennsylvania Railroad can charge itself a relatively high amount of money and that Tom Scott and others who are connected to the Pennsylvania Railroad can make a, can make a fortune. Now luckily that kind of corruption doesn't happen anymore, but there was a time uh, when, when uh, I'm sorry, I'm joking there. The, um, this, this, is, this is how Andrew Carnegie starts um, in the 1860s. But by the 1870s, he learns the steel making process. Andrew Carnegie was first a telegrapher and then a stockbroker, so he knew something about stocks. And um, he discovered the Bessemer process in this period, discovered this process of taking iron and turning it into steel. Previously, to take iron and turn it into steel was incredibly expensive. You used steel for razor blades and you used steel for swords, but that was it. Steel was too expensive to be used for or uh, anything substantial. And to make steel, you heated up iron and you puddled it. You had people who were skilled workers who were puddlers, and they would mix the steel around, take off the dross, uh, iron around, heat it up, mix out the dross, scrape it away, and let it cool. 
Heat it up again, scrape off the dross, let it cool. Heat it up, you had three or four heats at least to make good steel, structural steel. And so it was incredibly expensive, just the, the, uh, the um, heat costs to produce uh, steel were, were incredibly expensive. What um, Bessemer figures out is if you make a huge vat for this iron, you cook it at a very high, at a high temperature, but just once. <coughs> And then you inject materials that bind themselves to the impurities in the iron and then spit them up the top. What they'll do is they'll rise to the top of the iron like cream. You scrape that off and what you have at the bottom, as you can see here, is pure steel. So it's an, incre it's an incredibly costly uh, thing at first to make something of that this huge you have to be able to um, Have orders for steel that are in the, the thousands of pounds uh, th Sorry thousands of tons every month to make this work, but if you can make it work you can make a fortune 1873 is perfect for Andrew Carnegie because he can buy up all of his competitors because they're selling their stock They're selling their inventory at 10 cents on the dollar so Andrew Carnegie uses the Panic of 1873 to buy up his competitors. He creates Carnegie Steelworks, which is the, in Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, and much of the Midwest, <coughs> the only major steelworks. And it can underprice its competitors because it has this new technological process. So ironically, for Andrew Carnegie, the downturn of the Panic of 1873 is a spectacularly good time. It's also a good time for Cyrus McCormick, who, um, in 1871, invented the Reaper, but he could not be, was a, and his works were in Chicago, but he was not especially, uh, did not make an especially large amount of money. In 1871, though, he, he pairs the Reaper with the Thresher, so that basically you can um, cut the wheat and separate the wheat from the, the, um, the uh, chaff in one movement with, uh, with, a, with a combine. It's a combination of reaper and thresher in 1871. Now this idea uh, is a great idea, but um, it, would, it wouldn't have taken long, even with patents, for other people to copy it. Uh, but what's great for Cyrus McCormick is the Panic of 1873 allows him to buy up his competitors. So there are three or four other competitors who are producing uh, reapers and harvesters. He buys them all up because they are in a ca their situation where they need cash. Johnny e. Rockefeller also. Uh, again, he's not producing gasoline. He's producing, uh, well, he's producing um, kerosene, or that's the most valuable thing that he's producing in the early period. He founds Standard Oil Company in 1870. He's also very close to Tom Scott. And he figures out a way of using um, moonshiners throughout uh, Eastern Tennessee um, and uh, Western Virginia and other places uh, for his production process. Now, why would you use moonshiners? Well, it turns out that moonshiners are ex excellent at fractional distilling, because fractional distilling is a, is a method by which you produce uh, whiskey. Uh, it's also a method by which you take oil and turn crude oil and you turn it into petroleum, gasoline, naphtha, kerosene, gas oil, and petroleum jelly. So basically you heat up the crude oil and it, it, you distill off the various kinds of byproducts. And so not only does he produce kerosene, he also produces gasoline. These are all different, I, I don't want to go too much into the chemistry, but they're different um, chemical compounds that are all produced by the by the break cracking up of crude oil. And so you crack up crude oil and you can produce at the, um, uh, the top level here um, uh, petroleum gases, then uh, under that gasoline, which uh, is initially used, um, that, that's a, almost a kind of throwaway thing at, at first. Uh, naphtha, which is used to make chemicals, then kerosene, then gas oil, and then petroleum jelly. If you ever put um, petroleum jelly on your wounds, or uh, so that's, that's basically the last junky thing that you can get from cracking apart crude oil. And so what, what um, Rockefeller figures out is that everybody wants an oil, oil well, and people are going to build out oil wells all over the place. And there's not a way to monopolize this business because anybody who's got land can have an oil well. What he figures out is that the fractional distillation is the place where he can make his money, that he can refine better than anyone else. And the way to do that is to buy up all the moonshiners in the South. And that's what he does. Uh, but Johnny Rockefeller, who never had a drink, 
uh, sent out men all, um, all the way th through all, um, this region and many other regions in the hills looking for moonshiners, offering them good wages um, because they could do distillation. They understood the process of distillation. Then as other people started to realize that refining was the way to make money, not, not drilling for oil, they discovered they couldn't compete because they didn't have enough people who understood this chemical process uh, the way Rockefeller himself didn't understand it particularly well, but these whiskey makers uh, all over uh, the, the hills did. And so it's in this period also that Rockefeller makes his fortune. Finally, Philip Armour in um, Chicago. He, what he sees is that all the wheat is converging on Chicago, right? It's to be shipped to New York. And wheat is cheap in Chicago. It's a little more expensive in New York, and it's, a lot, it's quite a bit more expensive in Liverpool, the final destination for a lot of it. It's so cheap, and when you break apart wheat, you've got all this middlings left over, all this garbage left over. You can get the white flour that, uh, from it, but then all the kind of the germ and everything like that in the, in the wheat is left over. And that's perfect for feeding pigs. And so Armour uses Chicago as a place for gathering together lots and lots of pigs. And rather than reselling them up to New York directly, he figures out that they need to be cut up and uh, delivered, rendered into uh, chunks of meat in, uh, in Chicago. And this is the first assembly line in the US is Philip Armour's assembly line in which he takes advantage of this um, process. He buys up all the best land in Chicago, the, the land that's closest to where all the wheat middlings are, and he effectively uh, uses the panic to monopolize that business. And so the Gilded Age then is really begins in 1873. The big consolidation of major corporations takes place after the panic, not before it. It's a, it's a beneficiary of this downturn. Now, the trouble with a lot of, the way in which a lot of economists think about uh, industry, and this is from economists now, but, but economists on the left and on the right, is a sort of masculine metaphors of industrial strength. So, so this idea that um, you can measure the industrial strength of a country by how much steel it produces. And this is why Germany blocks American steel. This is why France blocks German steel. This is why Austria-Hungary blocks French steel, is that they want to produce more steel than anybody else because they believe that steel mills are the kind of measure of the success of uh, the nation. But what succeeds in the US is not steel. It's contrary to what you know, all, every American history textbook tells you. Um, it's actually canned goods. Um, uh, if you look here at this map, this is, um, the green part is exports. So US exports, as you see, d um, stabilize between 1872 and 1877. They go up between 62 and 67, but then they stabilize. Why do they stabilize? Because Europe is not buying American goods anymore, not as many American goods anymore. Um, but then they pick up again uh, just shortly after 1873. Now, if we look at um, imports of finished manufacturers, that is basically a kind of measure of American industrialization. It's actually going, um, well, it's, sorry, it's, a, it's a, the imports of, of finished manufacturers, that, that blue line is what's what we would call the, let's see, 60, yeah, 72. So that's, that's basically the, um, the closest version of that is, is um, the business cycle, that's the business. There's no Dow Jones industrial average in the US in the 19th century, but this is the closest thing to the Dow Jones average. And so what you see is from 72 to 79, it's dropping. But there's one industry that's counter cyclical. That's one industry is going up when everything else is going down. And that industry is manufactured food. Manufactured food, what is manufactured food? Well, manufactured food is the, um, um, is taking Armour's meat, cutting it up into pieces, and putting it in cans. Uh, spam, right, is effectively what's created uh, in the US in this period. Spam, that, that particular company doesn't exist. But what Armour does, and what any other folks do in the middle part of the 1870s, is take lots of meat, um, cut it up, put it into cans, and ship it abroad. Um, and this export shoots up through the 1870s. It allows the settlement of Australia, allows the settlement of Western, of Argentina, allows the settlement of Western Canada, all sorts of places where you have to have food for three or four years before you can support yourself. 
right? You can't just settle in Argentina. You can't just settle in Western Canada because you need to get a crop up. And there aren't any 7-Elevens around to pick up your milk, right? So you need some form of canned goods. Canned goods are critical, and the U.S. is, is the best, uh, most successful canned goods exporter in the, in the world uh, in this period. These canned goods are shipped all over the world, and, and um, American, uh, so, so a British Navy ship, allegedly, in 1880, um, they receive these canned uh, meats, and they, um, they're, they're supposed to be eaten on the ship. So, let me go back uh, a minute to this story. Um, the, um, in, 18, in the 1820s in Britain, there's this terrible story about uh, a man who is 21 or 22 who lures a 10-year-old girl into an alleyway uh, with candy, candy. And her name is Fanny Adams. He, he uh, lures her into an alleyway with, with candy. He um, takes her in the alleyway. He cuts her up into pieces and kills her and cuts her up into pieces. They never found all the pieces of sweet Fanny Adams. So this can of mystery meat arrives in Britain. It's opened up and one British, uh, so one British um, naval officer allegedly says, There's the, they found the final pieces of sweet Fanny Adams, right? And so that expression, sweet Fanny Adams, is, the, um, is, a, is a British expression for, of, of surprise and amazement. Uh, <laughs> And it's this, this weird mystery meat that's arriving from the U.S. cheaply to uh, Europe and the rest of Britain. It becomes poor people's food all over Europe. Poor people's food is this, this canned uh, mystery meat. Uh, in fact, um, um, it's, it's, uh, George Orwell says that the canned food probably killed more people in Europe than the Gatling gun uh, did. So this is, this, is, um, this is the story then of Sweet Fanny Adams. This American manufacturer of food really is the thing that pulls it out of the depression. The final uh, part of this is that once you establish tariff walls in Austria-Hungary, in Germany, and in France, there is um, international competition becomes much more intense. Right? Rather than free trade, uh, the issue is to try to find a market for your manufactured goods, to try to find a market for your steel, and then to find a place where you can get raw goods. And so this, in the 1880s, as you see, as a result of these tariff walls that come up in 1877, the emergence of the partition of Africa, as Europeans rush to Africa to colonize it and to take uh, different uh, pieces of it. And this, what we see is after the 1880s and 1890s is the emergence of imperialism. Okay, so what does all this have to do with 2008? In 2007, I read in the newspaper that the European Central Bank was injecting 10 billion euros into the other banks to get them to lend to each other because the European banks were not lending to each other. I called my wife and we have a retirement account. It's not, it's not huge. <laughs> It's not even big, uh, but it is a retirement account, and it was invested in the stock market. And I said, the European banks don't trust each other, and they're not lending to each other, and the European Central Bank has to, has to inject money into the account. Why don't the banks trust each other? That is scary as hell. And she said, what do you mean? She said, that's what happened in 1873. The banks didn't trust each other. The banks weren't lending to each other, and the central f f European bank had to, has to inject li liquidity. This is precisely what happened in 1873. She said, well, what should we do? I said, we need to take our money out of the stock market and put it in the bond market. Not our money, but our retirement. Um, in 2008, uh, I saw lots of other signs of this kind of very same uh, transformation happening. A mortgage boom, uh, lots of uh, uh, firms that depended uh, very largely on mortgages, a doubling and tripling of the values of houses in places like Las Vegas and California. Uh, and other people then started to see this, this uh, transformation taking place. And we saw this sort of financial apocalypse. Uh, I wrote a little article in 2008 in the Chronicle of Higher Education saying this is a lot more like the Panic of 1873. And the Chronicle of Higher Education, it's not a magazine you'd ordinarily read, they asked, um, all right, well, if that's true, if it's like 1873, tell us five things that might happen. I said, well, uh, there'll probably be a breakdown of talks over um, uh, on trade. 
because that's one of the things that happens. And that happened, oh well. Uh, probably the price of gold is gonna go up. Uh, probably, um, probably firms that have lots of cash on hand, like Carnegie, McCormick, and others, will do well. Firms that have low cash on hand are gonna be in trouble. Um, I said um, that probably um, trade with China is gonna become a problem, and the Chinese government is gonna to wanna to push for uh, denomination of the currency not in the dollar, but in something else. All those things happened in the space of a month, right? All those things happen. So um, I wrote that piece, and I guess the second day, it had not even been published yet, but it had been published online. And I got a call from somebody who ran a blog, Seeking Alpha, and he said, all right, who are you, and what is the Nelson algorithm? And I said, what? <laughs> he said, the Nelson algorithm. Tell me about the Nelson. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, your, your, your article has been circulating among fund managers, in among a lot of these fund manager chat rooms, and somebody has created a Nelson algorithm which, bought, which it predicts what stocks will rise and which stocks will fail based on cash on hand, because you can use Google Finance to calculate which firms are high cash on hand and which ones are low cash on hand. Chrysler, it turned out, was in trouble. Uh, because it was low cash on hand, because it hadn't quite issued its debt yet. Um, so it turned out that people were making, in the space of a month, tens of millions of dollars using the Nelson algorithm <laughs> for, for picking stocks. Uh, and this is that the stock market is tanking, right? But some firms are actually doing well, and those are the firms that were high cash on hand. Apple, Microsoft, uh, a bunch of others that happen to have uh, lots of cash. Uh, in any event, so, what are the lessons of history? The lessons of history aren't that there is any lesson. There's not a, one lesson of history. What it's useful to do is to kind of understand financially how these uh, panics and financial ups and downs move. And then when you see the headlines, you read them differently. When you see what's happening, you think, that when your stomach turns over and you think, gosh, I need to get into stuff. So I told this story about, uh, so I, I, I gave this, I'll, I'll give you my last little story. In, in 2009, uh, so fund managers kept asking me, so I gave talks in Las Vegas and Hong Kong and Paris and other places to fund managers, people who manage lots and lots of money, to talk about this. And at one, I was in Hong Kong and I was giving this talk and some guy raised his hand. He said, all right, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so um, 1873, I got it, I got it, it's important. He says, did you have any skin in the game? I said, uh, what? And uh, I, th I thought, I, I don't play basketball. And he said, no, no, did you have any cash invested? And so I told him the 2007 story. Bedlam, right, this room of very well-dressed men and a few women, bedlam. They're all shouting at each other and pointing at each other. And then uh, I'm at the top floor of this Hong Kong hotel, the 54th floor or something like that, of this Hong Kong hotel, and they're all shouting at each other. My talk is over, right? And um, so then they yell out, when did you get back in equities? Basically, when did I get back in the stock market? I said 2009. More shouting, more pointing, more finger pointing, whatever. And I said, well, I, don't, I don't understand. So at the end, like five minutes later, I'm talking to the vice president of this big, <laughs> big investment firm. I said, well, I don't understand what happened. And she said, well, what you did, no bank did. No bank saw the danger signs and switched to bonds in 2007. And getting back into equities, no one else has gotten back into equities in 2009. And you got back into equities in 2009. And if any bank had done what you'd done, they'd have doubled their assets in that period. No bank did what they did, and most of them have half their assets or less in that period. So the lesson is, Think about the past, sort of understand how all these things are related. Uh, don't pay as much attention to GNP and GDP. Think about all these complex interrelations because they do tell you a lot about not just 1870s, uh, but today. Thank you. So um, there's time for questions. I'm sorry, I went a little bit over. Do people have questions? Yes? Predictions. <laughs> well, no, I mean, <laughs> so, uh, well, I mean, what's happened is been there's this huge deflation of the market, and so reflation is what we've seen in the last year and a half. So I've been, I've been you know, we, the stock market has been shock, done shockingly well, right, in the space of uh, a year and a half to, to two years. Um, 
and uh, so, so that uh, makes you feel. The thing that worries me is the derivatives market, uh, the, and the, cons con the because the problem of leverage is, is, has, has been, continues to be a problem. I think the, the management of derivatives is, so I don't want to go too deeply into the, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the financial regulations, but I am concerned that the derivatives market shrunk very rapidly in 2007 and 2008, almost to nothing, right? Uh, and then it has gone back up again. And the derivatives market is the problem because it's a, it's a way of very, very heavily leveraging uh, investment. And so banks that have you know, a $10 million footprint can have, that, that is $10 million in cash, can have a $200 million effect on the markets. And so I think, um, that, so my worry is that, <coughs> The European Central Bank and the the Fed will not. Well, the no, it's not the Fed. The the organization that's that's determining how U.S. banks are going to be uh, uh, organized. That the two of them won't come to any any agreement, and one of them will have too weak a control over financial uh, derivatives, and will will be in this situation again in a very short time. So that's my worry. So I've been very closely watching this, this control of the derivatives market and, you know, uh, is there going to be a tax on derivatives? I think there ought to be a tax on derivatives, a small one, a tiny one. Uh, but the t a tiny tax on derivatives will force those firms to put, it, to put up cash uh, in a way that they haven't in the past. Just a small amount, but some cash for these, uh, these bets in the long-term derivatives market. Other questions? Yeah. Can, yeah. We blame, can we blame the deregulation? <laughs> yes, it's got something to do with it. It's got something to do with it because that that banking, the sort of shadow banking system, is very much like the sort of private bankers that we saw in this period. And yes, yeah, so deregulation has got a lot to do with what's uh, what happened. What's effectively happened is that a lot, many of the controls that were imposed after 1929 have gone away, and so we're back to the 19th century world again. And that's why the 19th century example works so well, is because. Um, we're back in the 19th century in a certain sense, uh, without, without uh, a century without um, really regulation of financial uh, instruments. 